Hi hey there. Uh, my name is Willie Bogue. Thank you for coming to our discussion on tech worker organizing for power and accountability, which is work that I did with my co-authors, Harini, Bianca, and Kath. So to motivate this, a lot of great scholarship in the algorithmic accountability space has focused on things like model audits, as well as recommendations for standardized designs, things like the Smactor framework for audits or data sheets for data sets. However, a lot of this work relies on voluntary adoption by companies, but the areas where these practices might be most needed are probably the ones where companies would be least willing to voluntarily put other important incentives aside. Conferences like FACT have spent less attention on how to push companies to adopt some of these great ideas. And uh, we see this as a great opportunity to, to discuss some of the, the ways to, to move forward there, to, take, to get some of these ideas like um, model audits, like data sheets, like model cards, like value cards, how to get them taken more seriously uh, by companies that haven't yet uh, adopted them. So we're not necessarily hopelessly at the mercy of the CEOs of these powerful companies. For inspiration, we can look at to some of the high profile incidents of tech worker organizing in recent years to push their companies to, to build more ethical products. For instance, in 2018, thousands of Googlers pressured Google to cancel their Project Maven defense contract. Was that an isolated incident or is it a well-known example of a much larger trend in the tech sector? In this work, we use an archive which documents hundreds of instances of tech worker collective action. The data was collected by tech workers and academics to study those trends more comprehensively than just using anecdotes. The archive was built by tech workers, union organizers, and a sociologist. The creator started by searching tech articles for employment and organizing keywords, and about 5% of the entries were created from crowdsourcing. In this work, we use the archive's expansive definition of tech workers, which is people employed or contracted by an institution that produces or uses tech systems. Uh, this includes representing actions from data engineers at tech companies, from temps and contractors at a, temp, at a tech company's data center, even when employed uh, through third-party subcontractors. It includes gig workers and sometimes even academics. However, the entries in the archive do skew towards representing the experiences of white collar workers. And as a result, this study also skews towards white collar workers. We do highlight a few examples of warehouse and gig workers in the paper, but su such actions deserve further investigations where their conditions and efforts can be centered. To analyze this archive, we used theories from political science and sociology. First, we used Gene Sharp's theories on nonviolent movements to characterize the landscape of actions in the archive. Next, we use labor organizer Jane McAlevey's methods to understand how workers built the infrastructure to perform these actions. And finally, we observe some trends of how this field has been developed. Gene Sharp was an American political scientist in the 20th century. His work on nonviolent resistance was influential to pro-democracy movements in Serbia, Georgia, Belarus, and other nations. And in part two of his landmark book, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, he categorized 198 types of actions, grouping them based on their methods, such as strikes, protests, boycotts, go slows, and so forth. Using Sharp's framework, we coded the 150 documented actions that had been tagged with the ethics label in the archive. By far, the most popular type of action was nonviolent protest, such as petitions and public demonstrations. For instance, we saw thousands of tech workers sign the Never Again Pledge to say that they would not help build the Muslim registry that the Trump administration had suggested in December of 2016. As this pledge got more and more attention, workers were able to pressure their own companies to publicly commit to not building any such database as well. Workers have also employed other tactics of non-cooperation non with their own employers. For instance, in 2020, some Amazon workers intentionally violated their company's policies around what they can and can't say about Amazon's impact on the climate. 
But these successful actions don't just happen on their own. Instead, they usually require weeks or months of preparation in order to attract participants and be successful. Jane McAlevey is a union organizer who got a PhD in sociology studying how workers build power successfully. By analyzing a dozen union drives, McAlevey identifies common techniques that successful campaigns employ to build power. The most important place to start is with having a credible plan to win. McAlevey believes that one of the most common reasons that campaigns fail is because their leaders are not honest with themselves about what it would take to actually achieve their goals. As an example of doing this successfully, we saw that the Never Again Pledge from earlier had a credible plan to win. It began with the most passionate tech workers writing and signing the pledge. As it snowballed into thousands of employees, companies started feeling pressured to make statements as well. Each time one company made a statement of support, that put even more pressure on the other companies to do the same. In the end, most of the big companies eventually were pushed to say that they would not build a Muslim registry. What made this plan credible was that there was a clear set of achievable steps on the road to success. But even with a good hypothetical plan, how do organizers build support amongst the workers to begin with? This is where structure-based organizing comes into play. Every organization has pre-existing relationships of trust and respect. Rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and cold call everyone, successful campaigns organize within existing structures. This could be by floor, by department, by community, or otherwise. One example of this was when the Google LGBT Employee Resource Group used their existing listservs and infrastructure to pressure Google to change policies about queer content creators on YouTube. This was an example of a pre-existing community that was able to leverage their networks of trust and to mobilize for action. And in order to understand what makes an action successful, we now look at structure tests. Before taking public actions, campaigns need to run internal structure tests to make sure they've built as much support as they think they have. Uh, there's nothing more deflating than calling a public demonstration that ends up having low turnout, and then the other side sees the weaknesses of the campaign. So instead, the campaign will make smaller asks first, such as wearing a, public, a, a support button publicly, attending an all-hands meeting, signing a majority petition, and seeing how, many people follow three, how, how many, seeing how many people follow through on these smaller actions allows the campaign leaders to identify which departments they're weak in and where they need to be spending more time building support so that they can then go on to have a successful public action. So having characterized the landscape of actions and examining the techniques used to build strong campaigns, we conclude the analysis by looking at some trends and considerations. One trend that we notice is that a vast majority of the documented actions were petitions and symbolic protests. And some political science literature suggests that early wins could be from the so-called fog of enactment. That's where incumbents initially don't know how to respond to a new kind of innovative tactic. And so the incumbents miscalculate. So earlier efforts like the Never Again Pledge were successful in part because tech workers had not been so vocal for causes like that in the past. And companies didn't know how to respond. And so they potentially gave more than they could have gotten away with it. However, the decrease in apparent effectiveness of these tactics in recent years could suggest that the companies have learned, for instance, that they could just take one cycle of bad press and, and mostly wait the organizers out. And this is why McAlevey argues that successful campaigns need to build the ability to go beyond symbolic forms of power up to and including strikes. With unionization campaigns starting to become more normal among tech companies, we will see how the tech sector responds to the formal methods used by organized labor and whether that changes the landscape of ethical design. We also observe some noteworthy aspects about the tech sector that are different from other sectors. For one, Sharp's framework doesn't anticipate domain expertise. However, the archive demonstrated multiple examples of technical experts using their skill set to give negative feasibility assessments. 
For example, experts opposed efforts from the Reagan administration to automate nuclear defense systems and opposed efforts from the Clinton administration to build backdoors to encryption. By saying these efforts were not just bad ideas, but uh, from a policy perspective, but that they were not technically feasible, that added an additional dimension of pressure for the campaign to push on. Another trend is that tech companies are usually competing to attract top talent to work for them. Unlike employers for teachers and for janitors, tech companies thus far have been especially sensitive to negative attention that could hurt their ability to recruit the best workers. One possible area that campaigns might explore is actions to pressure their employer on that front, such as by running an unauthorized workplace climate survey. Wrapping up, we wanted to highlight some limitations of this study and potential areas of future work. So one potential limitation is that this work is all done from the outside looking in. Sharp's framework, McAlevey's framework, they uh, provide general understandings of how to build power. But in order to really understand the specifics of these case studies, you would need to interview the organizers of these campaigns and what decisions they made and potentially what mistakes they made using tools like interviews and, and other methods from ethnographic studies. Another limitation is that the collective action in tech archive uh, has, has some limitations in, in how it was constructed. For instance, the overrepresentation of white collar workers. And uh, uh, a final limitation that we point out is that the archive, it documents actions, not campaigns. And so it, it doesn't have a retrospective, here's a protest and two years later, it will have this success and this kind of backlash. Uh, it doesn't have that. It's entries are articles written at the time. And so in, instead, it can tell you how many people came to the protest. Uh, and it might, uh, if, if it's thoroughly researched enough, be able to contextualize it in what had happened thus far. But fundamentally, these entries in the archive don't document the long-term outcomes of the actions. Uh, and that's, that's sort of what we mean when we say that the archive centers actions, not campaigns. So in conclusion, we, in this work, we examine the relationship between AI ethics and employee activism. In contrast to much of the other work in the field, we consider theories of change that do not require corporate buy-in and might even be complementary to some of these frameworks. For instance, such that it can push the company to adopt Raji's Smactor framework for algorithmic accountability and audits. We situate the tech worker collective action in theories of social movements and labor organizing. And we demonstrate the large impact that such actions have had on tech companies and their products by highlighting that landscape. And we also detail concrete methods for effective organizing based on McAlevey's framework and discuss how they might transpire in the tech industry. So just wrapping up here, we wanted to thank the numerous colleagues that gave us feedback on this work. And we also greatly would like to thank the creators of the archive and especially to JS and Natalia for talking to us uh, in early discussions and giving us some feedback. So with that, Thank you very much. And we look forward to answering any questions that you have.